great. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Today, I am here with Dr. Sarah Shayette. She is a pediatric neurologist, so I was interested in having her on. Neurology is one of my favorite. It's my favorite specialty, I think, out of all the... My son has a very large team, but neurology is definitely my favorite and the ones I see the most frequently, unfortunately. Um, but she doesn't specialize in seizures. She specializes in ADHD. And in fact, she's published two books on ADHD. One she wrote with a karate master, and you can ask her more about that. And it's called ADHD and the Focused Mind. And her second book is called Winning with ADHD. And as always, if you have questions, you can put them in the comment section. And we're going to keep, please keep your questions focused to Dr. Shayette and ADHD and kind of on topic. I'm not going to be answering any um, general IEP or 504 questions today during this talk, but we'll do that in future office hours as I do. So today she and I are going to talk about making connections with our ADHD kids and some activities to build up their skills during the summer. Um, she and I were talking before this broadcast, before we went live and talking about, you know, there's really going to be a COVID slide. So we're going to have to talk about that. So, okay, welcome. You want to introduce yourself, well, say a yeah, few words? Absolutely. It's, it's, I want to first thank you for having me on the show, Lisa. I enjoyed our chat beforehand and mm -hmm. obviously Pediatric neurology has got to be everyone's favorite specialty. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have wonderful taste. And um, although I am sorry that you had to make the acquaintance with uh, at least one team of pediatric neurologists. Um, uh, yeah, I do a lot of work with ADHD and some pediatric neurologists do that and some don't. Um, this is, uh, ADHD is a brain thing, so I feel like I can, and I really like to. Um, I came at it through more traditional pediatric neurology type of things in that um, headaches uh, can sometimes be caused by stress of school, and, and that can be caused by ADHD. And so um, I kind of fell into ADHD that way. I have four kids myself and, uh, you know, they all get distracted. <laughs> so my kids range from age, uh, well, Jackie's going to be uh, eight this summer and my oldest is turning 23. So kind of a spread, but um, I, I love kids, obviously. Okay. So let's get into that a little bit because I think when we talk about ADHD, you know, a lot of even parents, they may not have a neurologist on their team for the ADHD. It seems to go more the educational route or maybe a counselor, um, psychiatrist, psychology kind of yeah. route. But you don't often hear about um, parents yeah. adding a neurologist to the mix. So you want to talk about that and, it, you know, advantages uh, and all that? Yes, absolutely. So, um Neurologists do, or pediatric neurologists do do a lot of work with kids with autism. And um, so autism and ADHD overlap in many ways. And I've written a blog on that. There are um, genes in common with both of them and the symptoms are in common with both of them. And recently the DSM guide, which is a handbook to diagnosis has allowed for co-diagnosis of both ADHD and autism. So you might have, if you have a high functioning autistic kid or a other autistic kid, um, you might have met a pediatric neurologist through that way. And um, because of the symptom overlap, we might treat your kid with medication or deal with ADHD in certain ways. Psychiatrists also deal with autism and ADHD, and they may make the diagnosis. Um, a, a psychiatrist or a pediatric neurologist, we can prescribe medication because of the MD part of it. Psychologists may be very helpful or other mental health professionals. It could be a MFT or you know, whatever the, um, uh, whatever the degree, but um, they may also be very helpful in managing the behavior, but they can't do the medication. It's really confusing for parents to know who to turn to. And you might start by asking your pediatrician who does 
the ADHD and what aspect of it you want to work with. Okay. Um, great. All right. We have some questions coming in before we'll get to those quickly before we go to our main part. Um, Julie, and I know this is a common one. Um, can a child grow out of ADHD? She's saying her child got the diagnosis around 10 or 11. She's always felt it's been autism, um, but he's not hyper anymore. Isn't that great? <laughs> so um, I'm going to just start by clarifying a little bit about what ADHD is. So we're all talking about the same thing. First of all, um, there is confusion between ADD and ADHD. So a, the first one, ADD, is like ADHD without the hyperactivity, but it's no longer a diagnosis that you'll hear from professionals. Basically, they changed it. I don't think it's a good idea, but they did it. Um, they changed it so everything is AD is called ADHD now. And some people with ADHD are hyper and some people with ADHD are not hyper. OK, so from here on in, I just want everyone to understand that I'll be using the term ADHD, although a lot of the kids I deal with they should be more hyper, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're more inattentive. Um, so, and I also want to make the point that we all have times when we're not focused and we all have times when we're focused and ADHD is no different in that respect. Focusing means that your brain automatically pays attention to one thing and doesn't pay attention to other things that it could it could so like for example Lisa right now I'm paying attention to you and I'm not paying attention to my dog who warmed his way into the room and I'm trying not to pay attention to the right side of the screen that's flashing but I'm focusing on you and I'm not thinking about all the other things in my life which there are a million um, when I'm not focused I might start by thinking with you or I might start by looking at you and thinking about you but then okay my dog's agitating to get out and you know the screen is flashing I'm so glad people are watching with comments and blah 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 you know like my brain may hop from thing to thing so to answer the question throughout your son's whole life just like your life there are going to be times when you're focused and times when you're not focused um, the that doesn't change adhd is diagnosed when you're not focused so much of the time that it's a problem so you know although your son um may have times when he's not focused it sounds like it's not that big of a problem for him anymore and i wouldn't focus on the diagnosis the hyper part of adhd tends to get better over time okay mm -hmm. So um, you see really hyper little kids, but you don't see that many hyper adults. You might see some fidgeting, but not sort of the I can't sit still. Um, and of course, it will depend on what people do, right? So there are times when um, your son's going to be in doing things he doesn't want to do or doesn't like to do or not interesting, and you might see the inattentiveness more then. Hmm. Okay. I, I'm learning a lot myself. Um, okay. Hi, Robert. Robert. Oh, he's just saying why he's here. Um, and Robert joins, he's joining us very early. I know from past videos, he's actually in Hawaii. So, um, but he's an adult living with ADHD. Uh, let's see. Can you talk about the irrational temper and decision making with AD, with ASD and ADHD? Sure. So, um, that comes from a lot of different things. One of the features of ADHD is impulsiveness. Impulsiveness means you do something without thinking about it, without planning it out. Some of that is good. You know, people who start a company, they have to kind of leap in, right? But some of it is not good. And um, uh, people who are impulsive, they get angry quickly, boom. They don't think it through. They don't think maybe I shouldn't be angry. Maybe they didn't mean that. They just go straight to straight to um, straight to uh, uh, anger and or a reaction. Is, yeah, or reaction, whatever it is, the impulsive decision. And um, the thing about it is that if your brain sees lots of different things all at once, instead of prioritizing the one thing over the other things 
for one thing, it's very overwhelming for a lot of people and they respond to that with anxiety and people who are anxious often have a more hair trigger decision making. Um, and, uh, you know, if you see lots of different things, it can also be harder to make a decision. So, um, you know, you just sort of pick one thing. So there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into that very excellent question. Okay. Um, does it, can a diet help ADHD? That's, I, I know that's a common one. Yeah. Right. So the, um, so there was for many years, um, a thought of ADHD as not something biological, but it's something that, you know, poor mothering and other, you know, it's all the mother's fault type of thing. And um, diet was raised as a possibility because of everyone's kind of observation that sugar and hyper may go together. When it's been studied, um, sugar is not a major culprit in ADHD. Maybe those kids are more hyper at the birthday parties because there's a lot of sugar and, and excitement at birthday parties. But um, there's been some studies that have implicated red dyes or uh, other artificial dyes. But I don't think that's a major part of this. I do think that starting the day with breakfast, which feeds your brain, is helpful. So don't we all get more irrational and anxious and hangry when we don't have the right food in our bodies? And that is your brain talking. Your brain is the most metabolically active part of your body. So pound for pound, it uses more energy than your muscles. Overall, you have more pounds of muscles than brains, but um, it's important to give your brain the right food. So I, I don't know that I would put a, an already difficult kid on a super restrictive diet. I think I would focus on good, healthy habits. Okay. Um, okay, before we get to some of the questions, we're going to touch a little bit about, um, of course, we're here in the pandemic, um, and we're on shutdown, lockdown, whatever you want to call it. Uh, my state's on lockdown. We're under stay-at-home orders until next Friday, um, at least. Um, so all these kids we have with ADHD stuck at home, and I know many, many states and districts have already said that ESY is going to be um, virtual. It's not going to be in-person ESY. So what can parents do with this COVID slide or over the summer, you know, with regression, yeah. preventing regression? Yes. And it, of course, it depends on the age and the developmental state of your kid. Um, but and, and, you know, many of us, myself included, are also trying to hold down full time jobs um, while balancing all of a sudden I have eight hours or more of child care. And, um, you know, many moms take that on more than dads um, just because of, well, lots of different it's, things, right? I'm sure. But um, <laughs> I just wanted to shout out to all the moms there, as well as all the dads who are taking out on the child care with their jobs, because it's, it's really hard to do that. Um, we're also in shutdown, lockdown, whatever, quarantine, I don't know what you want to call it. But um, I'm trying to take the opportunity to develop connections with my kids. Like, okay, um, for ADHD, a lot of kids feel very isolated and um, they feel very, you know, they get a lot of negatives. Um, the optimal ratio of positives to negatives is that you're supposed to hear about four positives for every negative. So if you say to me, oh, you were late, and but you know you, you should say four positive things to balance it out but i'm glad you're here and we're gonna have a great time and i hope that everyone enjoys it or whatever it is um adhd kids hear closer to 20 negative things for every one positive that they hear hmm. and what a way to grow up you know that is really terrible because then they develop this concept in their in their own brains, a self-image of somebody who's lazy, who doesn't achieve, who doesn't want to do things. Um, and then they become that person, right? So it's a negative cycle. If you have a bad outcome, then you go, oh, I'm, I must be that person. It sort of validates your sense of, an, of self as negative. And then you 
you're going to have another bad outcome because somebody who's bad at something doesn't try hard and every mistake is used to validate yourself as a as a bad or lazy person so um dr hallowell who's one of the you know real uh gurus and pioneers in adhd treatment talks in his books about the importance of connection of being just being there for your kids um not trying to shape their behavior but just to do something together and there's a lot of activities that you can do on lockdown that just develop a connection um eating is one <laughs> i'm sure everyone we've been doing a lot of that yeah quarantine 15 and all that and uh you know just sort of sitting next to somebody and and even if they're mad at you or whatever just just talking about food is always fun baking is an activity that a lot of people enjoy doing and then to counteract that you know some some families have exercise together and that's that's a time for connection so being out in nature meaning taking a walk around the block um, is a real relaxing things for people and um, if that's something you can do with your kid that's great my son is 15 oh, just turned 16 <laughs> and you know uh, many teenage boys not all but many are in the grunting phase of their existence and uh, he is too it's rare to get a whole sentence out of his mouth but sometimes we walk the dogs together and you know i don't really try to talk to him but just kind of being near him is good um some people are into music you know uh, you can connect by learning ukuleles together online. There's so many YouTube videos on how to do stuff. Um, and if you have a kid who can manipulate all the YouTube stuff, they're going to feel great showing you how to do stuff. So, um, you know, there may be some really cost effective things that you guys can learn together. I know that. Um, the dojo where uh, my kids go to karate and um, uh, you know I wrote a book with the, the teacher there um, you know they made the point that it's hard to do team sports these days but you can do martial arts online and so that's another thing uh, in my family my husband does that with the kids and it's a, a big connection there's archery there's you know you could rig up some fencing thing learning to program on computers i mean like who who wouldn't want to learn that good there's a lot of things that you can do that you're near somebody that you're not trying to make them into something but you can both enjoy together and that mm -hmm. would be really helpful so that later on you can use that connection in order to impart some wisdom too great ideas um Okay, so let's talk a minute about comorbid conditions. Um, I know in my experience as an IEP and 504 advocate with parents, um, you know, I often use the phrase ADHD rarely travels alone. Mm -hmm. um, there are quite often comorbid conditions. How can a parent like piece out what where the issues are and what to address? And, you know, our specific question from from one of our viewers is um, if it's a comorbid condition that is typically something you don't medicate for like dyslexia how do you know what you know should you be medicating or, or even considering medication or not right so i think the best way to do this is to think about the symptoms rather than your diagnostic list like your child is not a diagnostic list your child is not a collection of diagnoses basically your child may have difficulties with attention difficulties with reading difficulties with socialization and those traits can be overlapped in different conditions now as an iep or 504 advocate it's more important to have okay this that the other thing because right. that's the language the schools talk so the diagnosis is useful but your brain doesn't like have different compartments for this or the other thing it, it kind of all works together so if you have difficulties with your brain recognizing letters and letter sounds as in dyslexia 
you have to know that that means that reading is going to be hard for your kid. So your kid may have anxiety about reading and your kid also may have inattention for reading because it's so hard to do. And so trying to figure out what is going on rather than which diagnosis is there um, is often really more helpful uh, on a practical basis. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, identifying the needs. And that's, that's great. That's typically the advice I give to parents is, you know, it's about what needs they have. Yes, um, exactly. So, um, you know, it's, it's never just one thing. But, um, if, you know, if your child has difficulty with socialization, the attention to do that is often going to be um, problematic, right? So yeah. we all want to avoid things that we don't like to do. Yep. Um, okay, another question. As a pediatric neurologist, how do you educate individuals who have not seen or interacted with a person with ADHD? And how do you offer better awareness even among educators who are not being properly trained about the different challenges with ADHD? Um, that is where <laughs> it is difficult. So that's why, I, that's why I wanted to start by talking about what ADHD was, because I'm sure all of your listeners and um, viewers, I guess I should say, right. um, come to this with different ideas about what ADHD is, not the least of which a lot of people just all over the place rolling their eyes and saying, oh, ADHD moment. So, um, you know, I try to use practical down to earth language so everyone is understanding what things are, what is happening. Hey, let me get rid of the dog. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's that all right. Do it. Um, so, you know, again, the diagnosis of things can change over time. The diagnosis of ADHD now is different from, you know, where it was many years ago, and it will be different in the future. So trying to get away from the language that is confusing um, to so many people would be really helpful. Yeah, it would be. Um, I Yeah, I think... I, I, and that's why I always often tell parents to focus on the areas of need and not the diagnosis, because when even when you have that label, whether it be autism, ADHD, everybody gets a picture in their mind. Of, that's exactly it. Of the last you know, person you saw with autism or ADHD. Right. And it's like, OK, then we go to the autism or ADHD playbook and do this, that and the other thing. And right. that I, you know, I've yet to meet two children who were exactly the same. Or right. two adults who are exactly the same and we we all it's not just a diagnosis but it you know what goes into functioning is how people think of themselves how they've been treated over time um you know what they believe is possible their their hopes and their view of the future is really important as to how they're going to do and right. so even if there are two kids with adhd or autism <laughs> or whatever it is um, then, you know, their individual experiences, how much anxiety they, they have, their just, just, just sort of natural tendencies. So some people are naturally very organized. They're going to do better even if they're inattentive because life's easier when you're actually organized. So, you know, there's so many factors that go into the outcome. It's important to consider the whole person. Right. Um, Jessica, your questions. I'm going to skip over your question. We actually had an executive function coach on yesterday. Um, so we did a, a whole hour just on executive functions. So um, I'll let Dr. Shayette, if she wants to like say something briefly about executive functioning, go ahead. But we're not going to get too much into that, because like I said, if you look on yesterday's uh, Facebook Live, there's a whole hour on it. Um, but do you want to just mention it for a minute? Sure. Executive functioning is sort of like the mom part of your brain that says, do this now, do this later, finish that, uh, don't do that. Um, so, you know, that's basically it. And like I was just saying, executive functioning and organization are, are somewhat synonymous, not perfectly. And, um, you know, your child is going to do better and feel better if they can get some degree of organization because that will will help them function better. So doing that to some degree, you know, not alphabetizing their sweaters or whatever, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be crazy, but trying not to spend so much time frustrated with missing things or losing things is, is helpful. 
Right. Okay. Um, so is it possible to figure out what makes a child have an extreme attention deficit? For example, why they keep drifting or what, you know, like they said, what, what causes those neurons to keep firing, so to speak? Yes. Great question. So, um, you know, in terms of what causes this, ADHD is felt to be genetic. Some of the genes are known and some of them are probably not known and how the genes work together with every other thing is really unknown. And um, so I, I'm sure someday we'll be able to like run your blood through the machine and really tell you what causes this. In addition to genetic causes, there can be, you know, environmental causes, difficult births or pregnancies, um, you know, deprivation, emotional issues. There's, there's a lot of causes why some people are more severe we, we can't really tell you that some of the genes involved have to do with um, dopamine processing and that's dopamine is one of the chemicals involved in the reward part of your brain so um, you know ADHD kids do respond differently to rewards than than some other uh, other people but also um, you know, think about the things that make you less attentive over time. If you're tired, if you're bored, if you're hungry, if you're depressed, if you're worried, all of those things can contribute to why a given person is inattentive at a particular time. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I, sometimes I think we expect kids to really behave better than what we, or per, not necessarily even behave, but perform at a different level better higher level than what adults perform because you know we're allowed to have bad days and there's a lot of days you know where not a lot but days where you say i just really can't you know i plan to do this chore today and it's a non-preferred item you know and we say oh you know what i'm going to put it off for a day yeah um, and that's why you know. some adults do better and that you could think of that as outgrowing although like i said we all have the capability to be inattentive so you know as a kid, everyone has to do everything the same way, the same time, consistently, at least in the previous life that we had at school. And that is another plus of this time at home in that you do have more um, leeway for getting things done. And um, I, you know, now that I'm home with my uh, youngest and I'm looking at the stuff they have to do at school, I'm like, God, this is really boring. And, you know, I'm like, eh, don't do that. You don't have to do that. And so, um, you know, I, I think as an adult, you have more flexibility and you are able to choose things that you like to do more in general. On the other hand, the consequences of uncontrolled ADHD as an adult are worse. So mm -hmm. if you have um, ADHD as a kid and you don't turn in your homework, okay, everyone's mad at you, you get a zero or whatever it is. As an adult, if you don't turn in your taxes, you know, <laughs> bad things happen there. Right. If you don't turn in your stuff at work, you get fired. There is no food on the table. You know, if you don't listen to people, okay, your parents are mad at you, but as an adult, my goodness, you know, you've got divorces and, and you know, just major things. So there's a lot of um, benefit in addressing this earlier rather than later. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to tread lightly on this next one because I know I don't expect you to give medical advice online and certainly don't expect you to give um, advice about prescriptions online. Um, but the question is, does Adderall really help? So maybe if you, I don't know if you want to give your opinion yeah. on on medicating overall, you know. Yeah. So so uh, you're right. I, I can't give anybody medical advice online, but I can speak in generalities. And um, just like everything, Adderall helps some people and doesn't help other people. And but for some people, it is amazing and life changing. I have seen F students become A students, and more importantly, because like, who cares about grades in when you're in seventh grade? Like, do you know the grades I got in seventh grade? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody cares either. So it's not the grades, but when you do well, you walk around, you're proud of yourself. Everybody recognizes you as excellent. So yes, Adderall can do that for some people. And for most of these medications, you know, there are 
um, you know, it's a biological thing that's going on in your brain and it would make sense that some medications can help. There are some people who seem to do well with any medication that they take and there are other people who are extremely sensitive and have every side, of, a side effect on every medication that I try them on. Um, and certainly, as the author of two books on the non-medication strategies, I really believe that those are important too. But yes, Adderall can be life-changing or Focalin or Vyvanse or, you know, any of these medications. Right. And I think that goes, I mean, that goes for any, I mean, chemotherapy works for some cancer patients and others. Exactly. It does yeah. not, you know, it's, it's an anxiety and depression and, I yeah. can't even take Tylenol. Like for me, Tylenol makes the headache worse. I don't, I have, you know, who knows why, but it does. Individual, um, you know, <laughs> everyone's always asking me for the medication that does all of the good and none of the bad. And if I had that, my job would be so easy. I'd be like, open up, open yeah. up, <laughs> you know, but it's not so easy, unfortunately. Yeah. Um. Okay. Kathy, we already touched on that question a couple minutes ago. I hope you caught it. Um, Robert, again, as a member of, of IEP teams, uh, oh, oh, whoops, he's just giving me a compliment. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> not a question. You can, um, you can read that one aloud if you want. We have time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Anitra, I have noticed different studies or trials being performed on in individuals with ADHD by neurologists, but it usually is only offered for individuals under the age of 12. Is there a specific reason that they focus on younger kids and ignore individuals over that age? Well, that's a great question. And um, I don't know if I really know the answer to that because I don't do those trials. But one thing I will say is that over the age of 12, there gets to be a lot of complicated emotional stuff that goes along with ADHD. It's sort of like teenagerhood magnified. And um, <laughs> You know, when people are anxious or depressed or otherwise emotional, it makes it harder to be rational. So basically, you can think of your brain as having two parts. One part is the emotional part and, you know, fill in the blanks, emotional, angry, sad, whatever, worried. And the other part is the thinking part of your brain and the um, emotional part of your brain has a physical connection to your thinking part of your brain and it, it turns it off. That's probably from the days of the saber tooth tiger, tiger, you know, like, ah, danger. Is that really a tiger? You know, they, your brain didn't want you to overthink that. So, um, uh, but what this means is that when you're really worried about something, it's hard to think about it in a rational, think straight about it. Um, you know, like for me, when my older kids were starting to take planes and go places by themselves, I'd be like, oh, my God, the plane's going to crash. You know, ah! And as soon as they landed and texted me, they were fine. I'd be like, yeah, of course, they're probably safer in a plane than anywhere else. You know, the right. planes never crash, blah, 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 or not, almost never and all that stuff. But while I'm emotional about it, I, it's hard for me to think rationally about it yeah and so um you know when you get to be over 12 there's definitely more emotional stuff and more sort of baggage from the previous seven eight nine years of having all that 20 to 1 negative statements that we talked about earlier uh, yeah and i as a parent who has um pursued many um clinical trials for my son um, what a lot of people don't realize is when you do a clinical trial, you can't change anything right. at all. Like you it can't has change. To be like very specific, right? Yeah, it's very specific, and you you agree that you're not going to change anything else about your child's life during the clinical trial, and that might be easier to control under age 12. Um, yes, you know, and that I might will be also mention, you know, just on a physical level, um, the the brain of a child is physically completely different from the brain of an adult. I mean, if you are, if you ever look at a look at it, I mean, it's, it's not just that it's a smaller adult brain, but it's physically different. The myelination, all the different things in it are, are not little adults. And once kids start talking, 
um, I think people start expecting um, yeah. that them to be little adults and they really have different perspectives on things. And one thing that's really helpful is trying to see things from your child's point of view. So, um, you know, we're all like, you got to do your homework because, you know, you will never get to college and, you know, you're, you're going to turn into an irresponsible surfer dude, beach bum, whatever it is. <laughs> See, I am on the West Coast, right? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 that, that won't happen in Philadelphia. Don't in Philadelphia. Okay. I don't know what people turn into in Philadelphia, but be all that as it may. But, yeah. you know, we have all this like blah, 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 blah. Here's the, you know, you, of course we want you to be a responsible person. And the child is sitting there going like, why do I have to do this homework? It's like really dumb. And why do I have to do dumb things? And so, you know, kind of turning it from the, assign it's not about the assignment that's something that an adult can help a child do but you really have to kind of understand things from your child's point of view yeah um okay before i get to jim's question about another non-medication question um julie asked about your books i mentioned them at the beginning i'll say them again right now um the one is called adhd adhd in the focused mind and the second one is called winning with adhd and yeah. as always, when we wrap up this talk later today or tomorrow, I send out an email to everybody. I put it on Facebook. I tweet it out. I put it in the group. Um, I put it everywhere with links of where to get her books. Um, and of course, if you're watching us right now, you can see her name over there on, whoops, no, there, over there, <laughs> <laughs> over there um, on the side. You can see how to spell her name if you want to look her up on you know, Amazon or where. Is, is it on Amazon? Oh my gosh, my entire life practically, I think. Yeah, okay. But um, yeah, my books are available on Amazon and also they're available in audio because I recorded them um, with my co-authors. Um, so audiobooks are available as well wherever you get audiobooks. And oh, good. so um, like Audible or whatever. Um, so I have two books. One is my first one is ADHD in the Focus Mind. I'll mention my husband, who's a psychiatrist as a co-author, um, as well as um, uh, like my kids have been taking karate from Peter Johnson, who's my other co-author for many years. And that book started because you know, when I'd be the mom and I'd hear Pete yelling at the kids, hey, focus your eyes, focus uh -huh. your mind, you know, all the things that they were learning in karate, those were really helpful things in the rest of their life. And that's kind of how the idea of the book was generated. And we talk about how the athletic techniques that, you know, world class athletes, as well as seventh grade soccer players um, use are really helpful in terms of focusing in school and at home. And so um, it's all about the non-medication strategies, although, again, there's a little chapter in the back about medications, which can be helpful. Um, it's the only book in history written by a pediatric neurologist, a psychiatrist, and a karate <laughs> that one and my other book and so that's a book that's mainly for parents um the uh other book winning with adhd is written with a lovely young woman named grace friedman and she has a uh, site called addyteen.com she talks to adhd teens in their language my kids were very very clear that my language was not good <laughs> But um, so that book is aimed mainly at middle and high school students and told from the perspective of somebody who had been there herself with an assist from me. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Um, OK, so going into another non-medication idea, um, CBT. Um, and your thoughts on that? Oh, oh, <laughs> half the time I'm asked about CBD and half CBD, the time I know. I'm asked about CBD. <laughs> T, cognitive behavioral therapy. And so um, that's that's the one you asked about, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, that is therapy for people who can reason out, you know, kind of like, um, here's what I want to do. It's helpful for setting goals. And if you have a clear goal, that helps your focus. If you know how to get to your goal, 
um, the, the CBT is what will help you kind of take the steps to go from point A to point B. And so it can be very helpful for kids. Some kids are not motivated to go to therapy. And um, I can understand that, but the same kids who have coaches and other, you know, adults in their lives that help them, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar to having a therapist. So if you have a kid who won't go to therapy, you can certainly um, mention to them that, you know, they have a soccer coach, they have a tennis coach, they have a whatever coach, and what's the difference? And it's hard for them to name that. Sometimes it's not helpful, or oftentimes I would say it's not helpful to do coaching for the kids themselves, particularly younger kids. Um, I think their parent coaching is more helpful. There's a, a site called Impact ADHD, and they have something called Sanity School. And I refer a lot of people over to them because they have excellent and very cost-effective parent coaching available. You could also work with psychologists or therapists locally. Oh, good. Um, and again, I will include all these resources with whatever links to whatever she mentions um, when I send it all out. Um, let's see. Joanne's asking about uh, anxiety and ADHD and telling the difference. We talked a little bit about um, comorbid conditions, but do you want to touch on anxiety and ADHD specifically? Yeah, that's a great question because anxiety is one of the most common emotional things involved with ADHD. Like I said earlier in the broadcast, you know, when your brain is sort of seeing lots of different things, it's the same feeling you get when you get back from vacation and there's like all these million things that you have to do and everything's yelling, do me, do me, do me, do me, do me, blah. And then you wind up um, doing little parts of everything and you don't get anything done. And so you never get that good job because, you know, it's like me last Sunday. I had a million things that I wanted to do, and I did a little of this and did a little of that. And at the end of the day, I was working. Believe me, I wasn't sitting around, but nothing got done, and I had my same to-do list to do, you know, for this weekend. So that's a real anxiety-provoking situation. So anxiety is often found with ADHD. And like I said uh, also earlier, when you're anxious, it's harder to focus. And when it's harder to focus, it makes you more anxious. So it's really difficult. Anxiety can mimic or worsen ADHD, in other words. Hmm. And sometimes it is hard to know if you're choosing a medication or a route for therapy, what do you do first? You know, sometimes, sometimes it's helpful to go back you know, in, in younger kids before they were, um, before they were, uh, um, let me rephrase that, before they um, got anxious, they may have had significant difficulties focusing. And in that case, knowing what came first can sometimes help you as a target for therapy. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between ADHD and girls and boys and some of the differences and maybe clinical signs that you see that are different? Maybe they're not different. Maybe that's a myth. <laughs> I, I, I may be getting too old fashioned, but I do think that there are differences in girls and boys brains. Um, my older daughters may argue that one is, you know, that is this true genetic or is this from being raised with cultural cues and I'm not going to get into that at this point but you know girls I would say tend to be more quiet and girls tend to be more organized these are general statements um, so it's one of those things where um, uh, when you're more quiet and you're more organized, you're going to get noticed as having ADHD a little bit later in life. So, you know, towards middle school, more typically for girls than, you know, a five-year-old running around boy, right. you know, crazy kid. So um, uh, I think it is different. And, and I do believe that, that as a culture, we do treat girls 
somewhat differently from boys and um, those differences can play a role in, as to when somebody's ADHD becomes an issue. Okay. Um, is this an executive function or is this just not related and perhaps maybe some overlapping or comorbid ODD, but is it a trait that a child with ADHD has difficulty understanding taking responsibility? I think is that, that is that taking, a common thing. It's hard to know what's the chicken and what's the egg there. So if you take responsibility for something, you are more likely to be focused on it if you have ownership of the goal. So that is one thing that, you know, really will translate from sports to real life. So or not real life. Sports is real life, but, you know, translate from sports to non-sports aspects of your life. So if somebody told you, you need to run a mile in six minutes, but you didn't really want to, and it wasn't your thing, and it wasn't your goal, you're never going to do it. But if you decide that this is your mission in life, um, then, you know, you can do pretty much anything. There's a great YouTube video out there called I can't, it's like five four. The guy is five four and he teaches himself how to dunk a basketball. Okay. Any or five five. Anyways, okay. I'll help you. I'll help you find it if you can't find it. It's it's awesome video. Um, so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, if you take responsibility, you're going to get more focus. But a lot of people won't take responsibility if they don't believe they can do something, if they've had failures in, in that before. So one of the things you can do this summer to get back to one of the original things we were going to talk about is, is giving your child responsibility. And that would be different responsibilities depending on the age and the developmental level of the child. But I, you know, I think uh, I just read Little House on the Prairie to my youngest. And my goodness, giving responsibility to kids was done back then, you know, and now we're like, okay, your responsibility is your school and your homework. It's like, okay. no, you live in a house with other people and you have responsibilities. And so I firmly believe that um, responsibility responsibilities will help build self-esteem and self-esteem will help build your focus. So depending on your job or depending on your kid's age, you know, having them find some sort of job they can do this pandemic summer, um, you know, chores around the house, maybe there's something that needs building or some construction thing if your child is appropriate for that, that you may do with them. Boy, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I um, I live near many, many Amish, so I still see a lot of kids, and I tell my kids often, like, I'm going to drop you off that farm. Yep. Because, <laughs> you know, they have them out there. <laughs> yeah, they've got them out there harvesting and plowing and um, right. all kinds and so, of things. At, you know, I'm not advocating, you know, child slave labor, but <laughs> I am just making the point that our kids are more capable then we are often treating them. And right. And, they, and, you know, yeah. like we want people who take, that society needs people who take responsibility and who look for ways to contribute. Right. Okay. So let's wrap up. We're, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, what are, you know, what's your takeaway message for parents this summer? What, I mean, what, what would you like to impart on, on, a ton of right. IEP and 505, 504 parents. Right, of course. So, you know, education during the last, is it 76 days of quarantine? It feels like 100. For Pennsylvania, at least for Pennsylvania it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I just, you know, I think it's all pretty close. But, you know, I, I don't know about you, but um, the schooling, the academic part of schooling has been not so great um, during the pandemic. Um, for younger kids, I don't even think it's that important. They need to learn some basics, but, uh, you know, so a lot of what they are doing in class is not necessarily crucial. Um, but one thing you can do this summer is work on skills that you will need in the future. So, you know, if your child has some uh, executive functioning things, 
you know, you can always do some planning together this summer. So we're going to cook something, you know, can you make a list? What do you, what do you think we need to get from the store in terms of planning your time? You know, first thing in the morning, what are we going to do today? You know, let's make a schedule. Let's put some times on the schedule. And those skills will help your child in non-pandemic times and, and in whatever else that they want to do. Another thing is, um, I, I think that, you know, obviously we're all going to be on the internet for the rest of our lives, but it doesn't have to be continuously. So um, having some limitations to electronics is a part of focusing and a part of, you know, hopefully going to be a part of your summer. Um, I totally get it when you're trying to get work done and your child is in the background. Here, take the tablet. I get it. I totally, totally have been there. But, um, you know, electronics uh, are designed to grab our attention and keep it. And the rest of the world is not that way. So, you know, we we get used to a certain amount of stimulation from electronics. And then when you look away, it's like, wait a second, I cannot swipe my teacher out of the picture and, you know, everything else feels slower. And again, if you have a child who has a difference in their dopamine processing, that could get to be very important. So learning how to find rewards in something that's slower paced, you know, we've been doing some board games here. That's pretty fun. And, um, uh, you know, reading chess, all these other skills are things that can be done pandemic or no pandemic. Yeah, they can. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for being on today. Um, Thanks for having me, Lisa. Yeah, I want to recap her books, um, ADHD and the Focused Mind and Winning with ADHD. Um, and again, I will send out links to everything to where to find her and where to find her books and everything else. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed talking to you and I'm so glad that people put on so many good comments and so many good questions. Yeah, they did. Um, I have a very engaged group and they're always trying to learn more, which I, which I love.